I call the meeting to order. Mr. Benton's going to invocation. Mr. Trampy, the pledge. All right, heads, please. Lord, again, thank you for this day, these moments that you allow us in our lives. And Lord, I ask that you be with the families and the other officers and jurisdictions in Texas going through the trials and tribulations that they're going through. And as a country, Lord, be with us, guide us, encourage us, support us. Lord, in, in this board meeting, please let us do your will. Let us glorify your name. Amen. The United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Taylor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. First item this afternoon is approval of your <coughs> consent agenda. Kathy, could you advance the slides for me? My uh, remote is not very remote. It's too remote today. Um, thank you. First item on your consent agenda is approval of minutes for the June 14th and June 23rd board meetings. Next is allocation of tourism funding for the regional tourism uh, website. Uh, next is appointment of Kristen Gallick to the Rappahannock Area Youth Services and Group Home Commission as the seventh voting member of the commission with a term to expire June 30th, 2017. Item four, appointment of Carol Harris to the Rappahannock Area Alcohol Safety Action Program Policy Board, term expiring March 1, 2019. Next is appointment of Lisa Phelps to the Citizen Budget Review Committee for the Cortland District, term expiring December 31, 2019. Next is approval of a contract to MEB General Contractors, Inc. for uh, the FMC Wastewater Treatment Plant Belt Filter Press Replacement. That's on a low bid of $624,000. Item 7 is a, your approval of a no-cost extension and carryover of certain grants that were uh, expiring um, at, the end, at, at the end of June. And number eight is a Spartan Pumper Repair Insurance Claim. This is appropriation of the um, coverage paid by the insurer of $10,857.62. Item nine is reappointment of Sean Hockaday to the Transportation Committee for term that expires August 12th, 2017. Item 10 is reappointment of Robert Fogg to the Transportation Committee for term expiring July 12th, 2017. That is your consent agenda. Are there any members who would like to pull any items off the consent agenda? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Motion to accept. Okay, call the question. Seven yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next item is public presentations. Amy, do we have anyone signed up for public presentations? No, sir. Would anybody like to speak that did not sign up for public presentations? Mary Lou Collier, Mr. Skinner's district. A couple items I wanted to discuss. Uh, one is on violence. Um, violence begets violence. Just so much going on and we need to divert our attention to doing good for people. Um, the police are there for a purpose to defend us and, and help us. And um, there are some injustices, but all in all, they are there for a purpose and a reason. Um, the, the robot that they mention about buying for them, being able to go into hostage situations, I hope that they can increase the numbers um, it's, it's just a sad situation, but having been in court one day, the justice system is too lenient on these people that uh, do injustices and do crimes. Why do we have people out on the streets that have already killed or maimed people to do it over and over again and they keep getting back on the streets? Uh, we need to start being stricter on sentencing and when you do the crime, you got to do the time. Um, two, I'm 
grateful to see that there's traffic poles up at uh, in front of Coles um, and that traffic lights will be soon uh, installed to help prevent all those accidents they've had in the past in the shopping center. Um, three, on Tidewater Trail, there's a business that used to be an old Tidewater Market, and within the last six months, they got a rezoning, and they really upgraded the building and made it look nice. However, for the last, I'd say, two months, somebody has um, thrown rocks or shot something, and three of the large windows are broken, and they are an eyesore. I don't know whether the owners intend to emplace it or where they can put boards up, but I think the county needs to go by and see that and realize that something needs to be done. It's an, an eyesore, and it gives a bad connotation of the area, uh, seeing these broken windows. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak that didn't already sign up? Sir? Good afternoon. Uh, I would, I'm here, uh, this is my second time here in two meetings, uh, to talk about the, uh, the high-speed rail that's coming to the area and the proposed eastern bypass options specifically. I'd like to start off thanking the board for your actions since the last time. Excuse me, sir. Could you just state your name and district? I'm sorry. District? Forgot about that. Tim Davis, uh, 2110 Marengo Plantation Lane, Lees Hill District. Um, so I want to thank the board for the actions taken since then. Uh, I think uh, for hosting last night, we had the Department of Rail and Public Transportation come. Uh, several supervisors were there. Thank you for, for doing that and attending. Uh, we had over 300 people uh, there at the meeting. It was standing room only. It was an impressive turnout. Um, and there was a lot of questions asked and a lot of concerns regarding this bypass. Um, this was our first opportunity to have a back and forth with DRPT. There were a lot of attempts to get specifics regarding the studies being conducted and the decision-making process is going into the three alternatives for the, um, the high-speed rail implementation in the area. And uh, it seems pretty clear that there, was, uh, there are no details to be provided. Um, they've held it pretty much said, we will make a decision and I understand this is not the final decision, but this is the um, environmental study that will come fall set as a draft decision will set what the primary alternative for this area is. And in my experience, uh, once something is set as the primary uh, alternative, it's a lot harder to knock it off than uh, if you knock it off beforehand. So uh, I would like to uh, reiterate to the board uh, that Please do continue your efforts to collect information about this. But I would also like to say, uh, I would like to reiterate that I'd like the board to take action. I'd like to see um, the board, similar tonight, Caroline County Supervisors, they have put this on their agenda and they will be talking about this as agenda item and coming up as a position, with a position for their board. I'd like to see Spotsylvania Board do the same thing. And I'd like to see the Spotsylvania Board uh, make a recommendation to FAMPO to discuss this item and to um, essentially oppo uh, to oppose this Eastern Bypass option, which would cut through Spotsylvania. And um, I'd also like the board to consider taking that position as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else would like to speak? I see none. Let's move. Mr. Chairman, uh, next item on the agenda is a presentation um, to Ms. Karen Lovas, who I understood would be here. Is, is Lovas here? Um, if we could flip the order of things, she might arrive. Um, Bonnie Jewell is here with a presentation uh, seeking the board's authorization for the sale of 2016 bonds and uh, related public hearing authorization. Yes, good afternoon. Um, during the fiscal year 17 budget and CIP processes, we spoke with the board about the need to issue bonds for certain capital projects within the budget and the CIP. Um, and the projects for which borrowed funds are anticipated for fiscal year 17 are the school technology bus replacements and capital maintenance projects, replacement of the computer, 
computer-aided dispatch or CAD system, replacement of fire and EMS equipment, the animal shelter renovations, fire training center improvements, Hickory Ridge Route 1 intersection improvements, and the improvements at exit 118. And I do want to mention that there is an error in the um, executive summary today. I had listed as a project for which bonds would be issued the Holbert Building renovation design. That is not a project for which bonds will be used. Um, the debt service related to the projects for which bonds will be used is included in the fiscal year 17 adopted budget. Um, and in order for staff to move forward with the various items that need to occur for us to issue those bonds, um, I'm seeking this afternoon your approval of the resolution that's included within the packet along with the various other d uh, draft documents that are there. Each year when we, when we present this information to you at this time, it's always preliminary um, draft documents, um, and there may be some tweaks that are made to those, but the resolution itself is final at this time, and that's what you're adopting, please. Um, and the second action that I need the board to take this afternoon is um, once the bond transaction is finalized to allow for the bond proceeds and associated project amounts to be budgeted, a public hearing must be held due to the size of that budget adjustment that will be needed at that time. And so I request today that you please authorize a public hearing to be held on this matter on September 27th, 2016. And with that, I will answer, try to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Okay. Uh, there's no resolution attached here. Is there? Yes, sir. There was the first item, the first attachment, Board of Supervisors resolution. Yeah. Do we have, does somebody have it? Well, let's see. Wait. Hold on. All right. It's quite a lengthy resolution. All right, it's it's yes. it's um, it's new software. All right. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, any any comments, questions? Do we have a motion on a, moving forward on authorizing the bonds? I'll I'll motion. Any comment, questions? Call the question. Seven yes. Do we have a motion on approving the public hearing on 27 September? So moved. Any comments? Call the question. Seven yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, still not seeing the uh, award recipient, I'd like to proceed to the uh, open session side of the economic development uh, update from uh, Tom Ramora, our ED director, and we're expecting Curry Roberts from the FRA. Is that correct, Tom? Yes. And uh, I uh, handed out to you in paper form uh, Mr. Roberts' presentation. Hopefully he'll be here any second. I also gave you a very brief uh, chart or matrix uh, of some of the activities that uh, our staff are involved in. in. Um, this is somewhat incomplete, and I apologize that all the cells are not filled in and all the details are not here. We've been uh, blessed with many uh, activities and prospects and ideas, and uh, the time we might have spent uh, to clean this up uh, just wasn't available. Again, I apologize. This hand scribbling on the second page is a little... Uh, amateurish and I uh, didn't have time to do a better job. Um, rather than go through all of these items, I'd be uh, happy to take questions after mentioning just a few of them. Um, under special projects, line two, uh, we are helping to promote um, the use of two veterans services facilities in Spotsylvania County. We have a state Department of Veterans Services benefits office. We have a federal outpatient clinic, and we're going to great extent to make sure that everybody knows about that and that veterans can get to their appointments at those places by one means or another. We've determined that uh, there are some folks who will provide transportation, and uh, we're going to promote the use of these facilities and hopefully generate quite a bit of activity at them um, for the veterans who uh, deserve a closer place to go and better services from uh, these agencies. Item 10 and 11, Tourism Zone and Technology Zone, 
are currently in small portions of the county. Um, I'll be returning to you in the near future to recommend that those be expanded perhaps to the entire county. Uh, there's nothing that precludes doing that. Um, and uh, there have been some other counties that have done that. This is really a kind of a marketing mechanism. It allows uh, tax incentives and other things to be done, which frankly we can do without designating them as an official zone, but it attracts attention from people who don't know such things and may be coming from other states or in some cases other countries. Uh, items 15 and 17, we provide uh, staff support to the EDA and EDTC. Uh, I admit that I am not as directly involved in those activities. Uh, Debbie and Debbie are directly staffing those two uh, organizations while I am involved in some uh, other activities that require my personal time. Under business recruitment, there are a number of things there that we are involved in, and uh, Curry Roberts can also talk about uh, the support that we get from the state and the activities that we're involved in in some of those recruitment activities. Obviously, some of those are confidential and still under negotiation and won't be named by, by any name, but I can tell you that there are a number of them, and uh, we're hopeful that the, um, the typical national formula used for business recruitment is one in 70. If you count all of the tips and leads and articles and phone calls and emails and people who show up at your door, one out of 70 of those turns into a real project. The challenge is we don't know which one it is. So you have to go through all 70 and treat them all with respect and dignity and thoroughness and be very responsive and hope that, uh, that they come to fruition. The next page, item 36, is the regional tourism partnership that you approved in consent agenda, some additional funds for website updates or upgrades. Uh, we are involved in a number of other activities, a soccer tournament, uh, we're in discussions with Lake Anna State Park about supporting them, uh, of course, the raceway. And actually, one of the things we're trying to do is not to be the sole uh, organization that's running events. Uh, the 208 garage sale, which frankly I thought was not such a wonderful idea, turned out to be a massive success run by other people. We provided some uh, suggestions and some uh, minor assistance, and the citizens ran the program and did a great job. And I think the more we can do of that model, which is that we help people, advise them, we make connections for them, we give them ideas on where to find resources, but we do not try to single-handedly run all these events with a two-person uh, tourism staff. Business retention and expansion, I want to highlight uh, particularly, um, we are doing uh, preparatory work in advance of a test. The test will be for about 100 companies. We will do what's called a business walk. And we will visit these companies uh, essentially all within a couple days. We will ask them for their input. We will provide them with information about the county, about how systems work and how entrepreneurs get started and whatever. Uh, we will also inform them about the veterans facilities that we hope that they and their friends and family members and whatever uh, can be supportive of. The anticipation is that if this works in late August, we would now try to expand this maybe tenfold. There's no reason why a group of volunteers and staff and perhaps interns can't go out and visit a thousand companies. Um, typically, most communities are very happy to visit a hundred companies a year or something and they boast of their successes in doing that. There are thousands of companies in Spotsylvania County and uh, we hope to get to as many of them as we can through this business walk process that again, we're going to be testing the first hundred companies in uh, August. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, number 51, Route 1 revitalization, is something that came out of the EDTC uh, that's being explored now in terms of uh, signage and other kinds of things that might be improved in that area. And we have been supportive to the EDTC for this and a number of other ideas that have come from that group. So with that brief summary of a few items, I would be happy to answer questions about any of these activities or any other activities that you're interested in knowing uh, that, that we're engaged in. Mr. Spiller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to revisit item two, okay. the veteran services uh, promotion. I, I know we opened the, the clinic and, and uh, we have the office here. Uh, prior to that, and probably, uh, and this is part of my question, uh, veterans have been going to Richmond. 
And uh, I know that the, the local legion has been transporting uh, these people to Richmond. Uh, are, are, is there an idea with this uh, new facility opening up that uh, these people will then be able to have their appointments here rather than travel to Richmond, or for is certain, that not in the foreseen future? For certain kinds of things, yes. This is an outpatient clinic um, of relatively modest size. It's not a gigantic hospital or whatever. Um, perhaps the success here and the volume of people who come here um, might foretell of something bigger and better in the future. Um, also, people, I think, go to other places, not only to Richmond. I think some go north and depending on the kind of care that they get, uh, may go to private providers. But we're trying to get those folks who want to go to these two facilities who are in Spotsylvania County to get there by whatever means we can provide. Um, and but, one of the things we find, and uh, we asked the folks at McGuire in Richmond, what can we do to, to help the process? And they said, get the word out. People don't know where to go. Um, and surprising as that may be, I think the uh, veterans uh, system doesn't necessarily advise transitioning uh, military uh, service people where to get their benefits and, and how to get them and whatever. And to some extent, um, people are not clear about where to go and, and what to get. Particularly, these two offices are new. So people may not even know they're there. So we're trying to promote the idea that they're there and they should be used. That kind of segues into the second part of my uh, concern, if you will. And uh, that is transportation to the local clinic. Um, is, is, has anything been done to uh, contact the, our local bus uh, service to yes. uh, perhaps make some, some stops there and uh, include that in their routing? Yes, uh, I personally made that call. And the FRED system cannot run a taxi service, which is Correct. point A to B when you want it to come. That's not something they can do. The Rappahannock Area Community Services Board, however, and others, volunteers, churches, and others that we're contacting may be able to literally run when you need to go um, in a much more direct and personal way. But Fred cannot do that. I understand that. That's Even if there are pickup points, you would have to go to the pickup point potentially right. an hour or two before or whatever and wait for the once or twice a day pickup. It's, it's not feasible. This would make us so much more uh, uh, veteran-friendly in this area. Yes. Thank you. Any other comment, Mr. Ross? I just had a comment. Tom, this is the, the second CBOC. There's been a CBOC in Fredericksburg. It was on Route 1, 1965 Jefferson Davis Highway for at least a decade. Uh, moved down to uh, Mary Washington Hospital area by the CVS Pharmacy. So this was an additional CBOC. It just doubled their capacity. So we've actually had it here. and It's no different in what they provide, so there still is the Richmond or Washington, D.C. need when there's something like even x-rays. I don't think they do at the C-Box. And actually, uh, there was uh, quite a competition to, uh, to win this facility in our county. Mr. Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things you brought up, and I think uh, we really as a county need to do this, we should have done this many years ago, and that is when you talked about tourism zone and technology zone. I mean, it's hard not to say that the entire county of Spotsylvania does not have some tourism in it. Every place you go, you've got the Civil War artifacts and stuff of this nature. And also the technology zone, like you say, there's many counties that put the entire county on a technology zone, which is just beneficial to us. It doesn't, it doesn't affect you if nothing's going there, but it does give us a lot more incentives to propose certain things to developers, not developers, but you know, industry to come here and stuff of that. And if, if I'm not, if I'm incorrect, please let me know. But if we put a technology zone over the entire county, it's not affecting us at all. I mean, it doesn't hurt us in any way, does it? I don't see any particular downside. I would point out that the infrastructure may inevitably uh, direct people toward places where there's water and sewer and gas and electric and whatever. However, just because somebody's in a rural area doesn't mean that they're not a federal contractor, that they're not a, uh, a science research organization or whatever. It may, it may look like a farm, but <laughs> there may be all kinds of things going on there, legitimate uh, activities that would qualify for uh, incentives of some sort. So I think the arbitrary part of, of picking a road 
and saying one side of the road is a tourism zone or technology zone and the other side is not, is, is uh, not meaningful and is arbitrary. And my recommendation would be that we consider changing that and opening it up to the whole county and let the decisions come by where there are infrastructure systems and whatever the company may need, but not by some arbitrary boundary down the middle of a road. And, and also you can overlay a tourism zone over a technology zone too. I think they can essentially uh, I, I, There's do nothing the stopping us from doing that. I mean, there really isn't. So, and, and this is where the logic and the common sense comes in, obviously. Just because you have two overlays doesn't mean that necessarily it's going to be used for tourism. But that way we've covered ourselves when the unknown or something that we didn't, like you said, have, have someone in a rural thing come up with something that really can help this county. And so uh, I would ask this board to consider... Uh, in the future, in the near future. Let's talk about the technology zones because some people may not know exactly what that means and exactly what that provides us or you for incentives and stuff of that nature. Same way with the tourism zone. So I, I think that's a, a very good point that you brought out, and we, we need to follow through up on that. Thank we you. We would be happy to do that. In fact, at the time we do that, we might also explain some other things that get confused, hub zone, enterprise zone, foreign trade zone, People throw those around without necessarily knowing what the criteria are. So when we come back with a thoughtful presentation, we'll try to explain, uh, for instance, we have a hub zone. Uh, people will say this, the entire city of Fredericksburg is a hub zone. That's fine. We have two hub zones in Spotsylvania County, um, and that is not always well known either. So uh, we'll bring back a, a thorough explanation of how all these things work. I appreciate that. I think it's very important for all of us to get updated or learn about them now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Um, I've got a couple. I just want to, I saw Mr. Roberts walked in, and I, I'm going to say a couple things. I, you know, in, just a few years ago, the, the uh, FRA was of almost no value to the county. They weren't producing, yet we we're paying money. In the last couple of years, I, I'd like to, you know, thank Mr. Roberts, because we're actually seeing a return on our investment from the county funds, and I think that's a good. The relationship is good, and I think we're going in the right direction with the FRA. But on another, the other problems I'm starting to see right now is I met with my EDA member yesterday, and now the EDA doesn't seem to be, we're going down to quarterly meetings. Um, I think they're, they're struggling for a mission at this point. And then we have this EDTC. So we have three groups, and I think there's a question about um, what are the missions of each one of them. And are, they should be mutually supportive, and at this point I don't think that's occurring. And the question, my understanding was the ED, EDTC was going to provide information to, to the EDA to make future decisions and uh, give them more information to make better decisions. And that doesn't seem to be happening. Whether the EDT, EDTC has grown too much and, you know, overcome the EDA, I don't know. And I think that's something that we need to make some discussions about to make sure that we have these different organizations that are supporting each other, vice taking from another. And, and I, I don't know whether that's a follow-on meeting or some other discussions we need to have. But I want to make that point because um, right now I, I was surprised. I didn't know the EDA went down to quarterly meetings, and we're, those are paid positions, and uh, and they're struggling for a mission. So there's we need to fix that. So I don't know if that's a follow-on discussion, follow-on meeting with all those organizations together. Maybe it's a offsite with FRA, the EDA, the EDTC, and some of the uh, the members here. But I think we need to. If you could take that for action, Mr. Taylor, yeah, or if there's any discussion on that, I'd like to just lay that out there. We got either as possible reports from the EDTC and the EDA to the board or for a separate meeting? Yeah, Take it may be up. a separate meeting, but something that we need to kind of work through some of the uh, what are the roles and responsibilities, because I think the EDA is not being effectively used at this point. At least that's my impression. So if there's uh, other comments we can hear, those are all one meeting. I might say that uh, the budget uh, this year did um, – uh, indicates some resources that would be available to the EDA. The expectation would be that they would come before you and make a presentation on the intended uses of those funds. So it's perfectly logical that the, that and the EDTC and uh, perhaps including all related groups is a, a subject for discussion at some point. Okay. Any other comments? Mr. Yakimowski. Wrong button. Uh, no, thanks. I, I think that we should have that discussion because I think it is very important. Um, having gone to EDA meetings until they went to the quarterly where they meet in the morning now, 
Um, I have only, I haven't made the morning meetings yet, but I did go to the original one where they organized and, and set up to do that. Then they were breaking up into subcommittees to, to further target areas so that um, you would have uh, shorter um, uh, organized meetings and more subcommittees where you could talk and get and get things accomplished. I don't know how they're doing. I've, I've talked with the chairman over there. He's uh, my appointee uh, recently about other issues, but I'll follow up with that. Um, but one of the things I know that they were struggling with for the past uh, few years, having gone to the meetings, uh, the issues that would come up were um, uh, just lack of funding. They didn't have their own stream of funding to do. They had put together um, four um, uh, targeted industries that they wanted to go after, and they did a, uh, a report, or they had a report done on it, and there was no money to follow through with that. So they kind of sat there waiting for the money. And so this year with the money that was allocated, I'm hoping they have a meeting coming up next Thursday, I do believe, that they could actually um, take that and go with it. But once they have that moving forward, I, I would say a fall meeting would be fantastic just to make sure that we're not tripping over each other, very defined lines, but then we're also getting things accomplished too. As far as EDTC, um, which myself and, and Mr. Sabula sit on, um, the, in my mind at least, the purpose of that when it was created was to have the board involved in uh, ED uh, matters and tourism matters, um, also getting the um, uh, appointees that are there. We have a, a, a EDA uh, position, we have a school position, uh, we have uh, my uh, appointee is the head of the hospitality association, so the hotels, so we, we have that being brought in. And what we do there, and I'll just give a, a really short uh, update of what we do, we basically um, discuss different ways that we can improve either tourism, uh, ED functions, the uh, revitalization uh, project that has come forward, of the uh, area of Route 1 up to um, Four Mile Fork came out of discussions of um, how do we beautify that area? How do we make it look nicer? And what does that take? And come to find out, of course, there's no plan that exists. Um, the, uh, there is a uh, plan that was out there from the largest land owner in the area, which is the Silver Company, um, where they had looked at the whole area and said, this is what we would love to do, but the recession hit and they weren't able to do it. So there, there are pieces that are sitting out there and we're trying to pull them all together uh, to, to put together a, a long-term vision because number one, it's gonna take a lot of money and we don't have any. And so what can we do piece by piece so that we can move the ball along? There was a rezoning that went on of a, of a gas station. And part of that uh, in discussions with that, with my, um, uh, uh, planning commission member was to implement some of the ideas of a revitalization of that area with beautification so you don't just have another strip gas station. It would look nicer. There were pedestrian um, safety uh, concerns that were addressed. There's going to be a crosswalk right there at, is that Market Street and, um, and Route 1? Uh, so those type of things were, were slowly being implemented but it's really getting the landowners that are in uh, that corridor to buy in because, you know, it's obviously privately held business and, and we're, I'm not, I don't want to force anybody to do anything, but get them to buy into the vision that if that's a nicer looking corridor, it would actually improve their businesses. And so that's one of the things that EDT uh, has done. Uh, Sister City is another one that we came up with and I have an update in my board report about that. But those are the type of things. So I. I try not to step on the toes, and again, I have not uh, gone to the EDA meetings now that they're in the morning, but um, w in the discussions, I, I'm, for me at least, trying not to step on their toes and make sure that we're not overtaking them nor you know, relegating them to irrelevancy because they have an awful lot of power that they can use, and there's a lot of things that they can do. So now that there's funding, perhaps they can bring forward a plan and we can really move it forward, but that's a, it's a good idea to get us all on the same page and make sure that they're that they're moving forward. Thanks. Any other comments? Um, was Ms. Roberts going to present? Come up. They have a copy of your. Uh, okay. No. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you uh, for having me here and thank you for your kind comments a minute ago. Um, I do want to double check, though, Mr. Yakubowski, I have it down for the 28th for the EDA. So okay. Thursday, a w Thursday a week. So if I'm wrong, let me know because I'm supposed to be there. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have it down for the 28th. Um, I also want to, you know, thank Tom and Mark and the team over here uh, in the county. We have an excellent working relationship, and it's been a very busy year and con continues to be quite busy. Uh, call your attention to the second page of the uh, PowerPoint. That's our tracking and activity report. Uh, won't spend a lot of time on it. You all have looked at this in the past. Uh, this goes through the third quarter of this past fiscal year. As you can see, we've had an increase in projects year over year. Uh, this continued on through the end of the fiscal year, so we're going to come in having handled more projects this year than last year. Uh, the other trend I'd like to point out is how many of the projects were direct to FRA as opposed to simply being referred to uh, by the state. We have uh, been a lot more aggressive with market outreach this past year, and you'll see that when we get to the marketing calendar that's a little later in this report. Uh, website hits uh, stayed up. Research requests, as you can see, nearly doubled. Um, a lot of that is owing to um, we, we've been a lot more aggressive in outreach in terms of what we can provide the commercial real estate industry. It also is reflective of just direct activity to the counties within the region. Uh, we've had quite a spike up in, in research requests from Tom and his colleagues and the other jurisdictions for projects that were going directly to them. Uh, I'm going to skip the organizational metrics. Uh, that'll be a year-end report. If you jump to the marketing metrics, uh, uh, this is where we track over from the prior year. Uh, we will not have three announcements this year that uh, we participated in, but there will be two. Uh, we will exceed the uh, capital expense. Most of that is, is because of the, the Harris Teeter announcement in Caroline County, uh, which if you want to lesson in patience in the economic development world, that project took 10 years uh, from the first time they ever looked in the region 10 years ago until they finally made a location decision. Um, another one of those projects, Mark, that was hurry up, we got to make a decision, and 10 years later they uh, made a decision. Uh, but anyway, uh, luckily and fortunately they are in the region. Uh, the one column that, that we're tending to spend a lot more time focusing on, and as you know, this is a new way for us even to look at, at how we do our job, uh, it's the end of the fiscal year pipeline number. Uh, if you'll notice, we started uh, the beginning of last fiscal year. We only had two projects in the pipeline that carried over. Uh, when we ended the last fiscal year, we had 25 projects still in the pipeline. There will be some fallout. I'm guessing that the end of year pipeline this year is going to be 30 to 35 projects that we continue to work. That's probably the most important number on this uh, chart. Uh, you've got, you know, it's a one in 70 business, as Tom and I have told you in the past. You've got to touch 70 things to get an announcement. Uh, so if you're, if you're really sensitive about people telling you no or not responding, this probably is not the business to be in. Uh, but there, there are some ratios to what's in your pipeline. The Greater Richmond Partnership keeps about 300 projects a year in their pipeline. Now, it took them 20 years to get there, and that's on a, about a million population base. Uh, they'll turn over 150 of those projects a year. Of those 150, roughly 90 of them just go away. They either don't come, go forward, they choose another location, they just become non-responsive. They'll get about 60 site visits out of the, the balance of, of the 150. And out of that, they'll get about 25 to 28 announcements a year. So roughly one third of who they get to visit, they actually get a positive location decision. If you play all that back to the 300 pipeline, you're back to about the one in 70 at the end of the day. They're a little better than that, uh, simply because they've been going direct longer than we have. Um, from a population standpoint and from the size and of our budget, I'm guessing that over the next five to six years, our pipeline probably ought to be something in the 75 to 80 range is what we'd like to build to, that there's a churn and then you would turn over about half of those a year, uh, which means 40 are doing something and we've got to go find 40 more to put into the, um, into the pipeline. So as, as we go forward, that's going to be a, a, a focus of ours on this chart and what we want to do. If you flip to the next one, it's uh, sort of an update of the website hits and geographic location. Uh, 
there are, there are two real big targets on here of, of states that we have not yet found, say, site consultant conferences that we want to attend or, or want to go in partnership with the state on a visit. Uh, two of our top priorities are California and Texas. Uh, the reason for that, uh, California has an awful lot of data center and tech businesses. We get a lot of traffic from Northern California to the website and down in the San Diego area. Northern California is probably cyber and data and software. Southern California is probably defense related. Uh, in Texas, we get a lot of traffic from the Houston and Dallas area. I think what drives that is that you've got a real critical mass of site consultants in those two markets, uh, very large real estate firms who do national searches for corporations. Um, if you flip to the next chart, you'll see what our marketing calendar was for this past year. Uh, as Tom will tell you, we all would have preferred to already have next year laid out, but the state was about two months behind getting us their calendar. We just received it about two weeks ago. Uh, we've given them our six priority choices. We did uh, consult with Tom and our colleagues in the other localities. Um, we take a little bit different approach here, and I think it's more prudent in terms of how we, we try to uh, be prudent with your dollars, not only us, but your own economic development departments. We try not to double up. A lot of other regions will take a whole mass to one place or one conference or one trip. We try not to do that. Uh, we ask our colleagues what they see as the priorities they want us to focus on, and then they typically will build calendars where they're going where we're not, uh, which I think is a much smarter way for us to, to, to marshal the resources that we have. And I think it, it's working well for all of us. Um, so until we see something that jumps out at us that, that I think makes sense, um, you know, where, where we need to be about three or four of us, I, I really think it's a much more uh, useful use of our resources to do it the way we're doing it. Uh, one thing I want to uh, point out on this, this calendar uh, in June, you'll see the VEDP business attraction. Uh, we did host a briefing for the business attraction and business retention team uh, at VEDP. Uh, there were representatives of all of our jurisdictions. Uh, Tom was off uh, on, a, on a trip with a, with a prospect. Uh, Debbie went down. Debbie Sanderson did an excellent job representing your county. Uh, we had a very large turnout for VEDP, about 40 participants, which is large for them. Um, and, and I think that'll grow next year. We had a lot of very good feedback about how we tried to do it in a more casual, more relaxed atmosphere than just coming in and boring them to death when we got this site, this site, this site. We tried to give them a broader overview of what's going on in the region. Uh, the final side, uh, slide is uh, sort of updating on strengthening regional capacity. Uh, Bowman and FNR, as you know, we've been having them do site audits for us. Uh, there now actually is a state program uh, to assist us. As you all know, we put up 75% of the funding to do six site audits through the region. Uh, we are working with Tom on the site audit that uh, uh, we will do on behalf of uh, working with Spotsylvania County and Caroline County. Uh, there now is some state resources to bring to the table on that. Uh, there, and, and one of the discussions, I think, with your EDA, I think this is very timely because there may be some interjurisdictional opportunities that the EDAs are the umbrella uh, that's been the model to do that in some other jurisdictions across Virginia uh, if you're trying to do something joint on a property. Uh, but we have completed three audits uh, so far. We're awaiting a word from Stafford on, on which uh, property they want to proceed with. Transformation 2020, we are still managing that on behalf of the university. Uh, Go Virginia, uh, that is the state initiative uh, that is trying to encourage broader regional cooperation on economic development and providing resources to do that. I am under the impression that the state board for Go Virginia will be appointed and announced sometime in the next week to 10 days. Um, we, as you know, have to establish a regional council. Our region uh, as defined, uh, what we think it's going to be undergo Virginia is not going to be just PD-16, but will also include the Northern Neck. Uh, I've been working with Tim Ware and his counterpart on the Northern Neck about trying to come up with a, an initial perspective list of that regional council. It does have to be private sector led. The majority of the members have to come from the private sector, which is why we're at the table. Uh, they have asked us and working with them for the FRA to sort of present a draft initial council uh, that they can present to the GWRC and to the Northern Neck Regional Commission, and then we go forward. 
uh, we would then, once I think they sign off on it, uh, we would come back and each jurisdiction has to opt in to work with that council. Doesn't cost you anything, but in order for us to get the state funds, uh, which is an initial half a million dollar planning grant and then two years of per cap funding to help implement what we come up with in the new strategic plan, um, each jurisdiction has to opt in. What happens if you don't opt in? You don't get anything. <laughs> it just sort of comes down to that. If we have competing regional councils and we can't collaboratively establish our own, uh, the state board can basically reach into our region, pick a chair and vice chair, and empower them to go set it up. And then everybody gets to vote on whether they want to play ball with that. We think it'd be better for us to be proactive than just simply waiting. Uh, but you'll hear more about the, that as we go forward. The big, the big bucket, they're going to be uh, two to three, four million dollar grants available three to four years down the road that we would compete uh, with other regions across Virginia. There'll be nine Go Virginia regions. Um, and there are going to be some projects. Uh, you all were having a conversation about technology and we've got some real gaps, uh, gaps in broadband. Uh, that's one of the things that we really share with the Northern Neck is, is some of our technological infrastructure isn't what it needs to be. Uh, there's some health care issues. Uh, I don't know, here you all were discussing that. I'd spent half a day in King George talking about, uh, talking about health care needs in King George and down the Northern Neck and in Carolina. So there's some, some real initiatives in there that I think can be very helpful to us as a region, but we need to stay out in front of it. Uh, College of Business, we now have a Center for Business Research. As you all know, I think we shared a copy with you of their commuter skills study. We, for the first time now, really know the skill set of our commuting population. As you all know, we market the region primarily to four industry clusters, which are manufacturing, distribution, and logistics, data, cyber, and software, uh, central centers, central service facilities like a call center or a central processing facility, and then public administration uh, around uh, DOD and GSA trying to find private sector solutions for what are public sector needs. 59% um, of our commuting population work within those clusters. And the commuting population has a uh, percentage of bachelor degree or higher is 37%. That compares to a state average of 32%. Very highly skilled. Uh, a lot of very technically competent people in that commuting population who I think would like to get off the road. We also learned that the average commute now is over an hour each way. Uh, that's up from about 40 minutes each way in 2007, which was the last time uh, we looked at that statistic. One of the studies that we're talking to the center about for the coming year is to do an updated study on the true cost of congestion. What's it not only costing businesses in the region, but what's it costing the individual commuter? Uh, because there's some surprising numbers in there. And if you're going to offer employment here and you're going to compete with the wages we already have here, I think we're going to have to demonstrate that it actually is cheaper for you to get off the road. So that would be the purpose of the study is to try to reinforce what we believe to be true. Um, so that's our update. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all have, uh, but we have had a very busy year and continue to do so. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So Lytle was last year, right? So yes, that's last year. Okay, so this year we got just saying. Well, <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, 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 just... no. If I might add, uh, without Harris Teeter, we wouldn't have had Lidl. And the reason I say that, Harris Teeter's site consultant ten years ago was Lidl's site consultant last year. Uh, so you never know. You always want to be nice to people. <laughs> is the moral <laughs> of that story, because you never know when it's going to come around to your benefit. I have uh, one question, if I could. Mr. Yakubowski. Thanks. Um, thanks, Curry. The um, GO organization that is being set up, uh, how is it going to work with our other regional organizations that deal with other issues like planning and transportation? Because the, the ED is, is not on its own. As, as you know, I mean, there's we have sections of our county that are zoned certain ways, and they're not going to be built up because our transportation is just awful. Mm -hmm. And so until we address those issues, it won't open up our infrastructure, you said our broadband, um, those types of things. So it's it's more than just trying to get a site. It's getting that site ready and, mm -hmm. and getting it, um, you know, getting it prepped so that when somebody comes in, 
it's all ready to roll. And I think that that is a discussion that this board needs to have coming up shortly is do we venture down that road, partner up with the private sector to get some of that accomplished? In addition to, um, you said about commuting, you know, I, I would have told you 10 or 20 years ago that eventually 95 will be, you know, getting better if we just, you know, do some things. Hot Lanes, the presentation that was given to us 10 years ago was, it was beautiful. I mean, it was everybody, almost like flying cars. But it didn't come to, to be. I mean, it's, it's worse. Whatever the reason is, it's just worse. So I think our argument and our strength that we have here is, you know, we don't have Quantico and we don't have Dahlgren and we don't have some of those types of things. But what we do have is that we aren't Northern Virginia. We do have, you know, at least, you know, two exits onto 95. We do have the Western um, connections that we can make. So those types of things, I think, are our strengths. So my question is, well, I had one about Go, but then the other thing, too, is how do we, you know, exploit our strengths and, and quit stumbling over our weaknesses? Um, well, let me, let me start with the second one and work my way back to the first one. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we found in the, the commuter study that was a little bit surprising to us, we actually have fewer commuters than we thought. Uh, the reason for that is most of the commuting data is based on Virginia Employment Commission data. So when, you're, when VDOT tells you how many people are commuting, they typically are getting information from the Employment Commission. What we used for the skill study, because of the data that you can get from census data and the type of information we were looking for, we actually found we had 10,000 fewer commuters. VEC tracks where the employer is. The census data tells you where the guy's doing, or the person is working. So whether they're working in their house or whether they're going to an office in town. A way to put this, I was in a meeting with the Dominion folks in the Stafford office for Dominion Power. Their paycheck all comes from Richmond, but they all live here. But under VEC data, they're in Richmond and commuting. So you gotta get, there's some noise in that data that first you got to get out. Second, I think there's a lot more telecommuting than we know. So a discussion about infrastructure improvement on uh, on, on the internet side, on the broadband side, may be one component of how to work on reducing the commute. Uh, but still, we're putting 61,000 people on the road. We are the problem on 95, just to be candid about it. I mean, we're sort of suffering from our own success in a way. Um, and, and I think it's, gonna, it's not going to be a solution. Now, if, if you go to our website, we worked with the Association of Counties back earlier in the year. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways a business looks at what's the business climate is the per capita tax burden at the local level. And in Virginia, it's fairly easy because you only have one taxing entity, you guys, in each jurisdiction. So it's easy to measure what are you taking in, what is the sum total of all your taxes, and then how is that spread per cap of all taxes. Um, and so we built this chart. And this isn't going to surprise you all, but our region, the, the burden here is 45% less than Northern Virginia. So there's actually a graph that compares us with other major regions in Virginia. We actually compete in that category, per capita tax burden. We compete with Richmond and Roanoke. But that's on our website. We use that in our marketing material. When we're talking, we, we basically, one of the ways we go to market is to tell people we're as far north on the 95 quarter you can go and have a southeastern U.S. business climate when you measure cost of land, cost of labor, local tax burden. And I do think that's something we need to promote more heavily, and it is a bigger part of our marketing package, just like talking about a fourth metro area. It says a lot about what you have from a capacity standpoint. How Go Virginia is exactly going to work, I don't know. And nobody else does either, as best I can tell, until they get the regional council established. Um, and, but the fact that the staffing for these regional councils is going to be within GWRC or the Northern Neck Regional Commission. So the work that typically goes on in the regional commission is going to be part of the information that feeds into what become regional priorities. ED is, is just one component of that, and you're exactly right, and there are lots of pieces of ED. If you don't have business-ready sites, I can be the world's best marketer, but I can't overcome no product. Or another way to look at it is 
a really good product can overcome a mediocre marketing strategy, but a great marketing strategy can't overcome a mediocre product in economic development. It's just not how it works, which is one of the reasons we started these site audits. We wanted to give the jurisdiction and the landowner a level playing field of what you're going to have to do to get a site up to business ready, which means somebody can be up and operating in 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's the product that we gave Stafford and the university on their property in Stafford County. It's the information we gave King George uh, on the Taylor property that they have adjacent to their industrial park. Uh, it's what we gave the city on the Hilton property, which is a 75-acre undeveloped track, which was the residual of the old Shannon farm that's on the east side of 95. Uh, and it's what we're, we're working with Tom and Caroline, uh, you know, on a joint audit on a piece of property that straddles your county line. Um, and so, you know, we've got to start somewhere, so you've got to start with a baseline of what do you have and what's the best thing to go forward with, then what is it going to cost to get the infrastructure there. In one of these, we found to get it to uh, what we would call business ready was about a half a million dollar cost. And that would get it up to where you've got sites, you've got utilities already laid out, you've got a master plan, you've got your zoning's all right. Everything is there except the building, effectively. And it would cost half a million dollars. Well, 125000 of that is local government fees to do the rezoning, utility fees, to reopen some proffers that nobody envisioned would ever get in the way, but now that everybody wants to market this site for a specific purpose, um, from an economic development standpoint, nobody else wants rooftops on it because of the transportation network around it. Um, that's where you can at least start having a conversation of, of, of how do we make some investments. Well, how do we get over the hump of, you know, and, and it's wonderful that Lidl's here, and, and we're very happy about it, but we got the warehouse and the white-collar, you know, um, office jobs went up to Alexandria. And so you hear a lot of, well, I hear, well, not a lot, but some people, and I, I guess they're the, the loudest, so you hear them most, um, is, well, you know, why can't we attract those big guys to come down here? And part of it is the infrastructure that we just simply don't have. Another thing is our, lo our location to you know, D.C. and the, the, you know, the center of the universe is right there, and that's where they need to be uh, for lobbying purposes and whatnot. So you really don't want to have a Spotsylvania address if you're going to, you know, lobby Congress. But getting those larger ones, in talking with the EDA, we had a, um, a site consultant that came out and did a presentation about two or three years ago. And I think a lot of it leads back to the the uh, infrastructure being ready and the site being ready to roll, because one of the things that businesses don't like is seeing a raw piece of land and realizing it's going to take three years to get that up and running mm -hmm. for their for their purposes. So they might just pass you right by, and and again, as you know, there's so many that we never even know, even look at us, and they just pass right by because there's nothing here. And the ones that actually talk to us have already done their homework for the most part, and they kind of know about the region and, and uh, kind of know what they're looking for. But I, I guess my question would be, is, is, is that the next way to go, or is that the next shell building idea where everybody had an idea 20 years ago, build a shell building, and businesses will come and, and occupy it, and everybody built the shell building, and nobody wanted them. And so, you know, you, you don't want to sort of follow the, the trend at the tail end, but you also want to make sure that you're doing the things that are necessary to bring the businesses here because it's not only the manufacturing jobs and the distribution jobs that we want, because we do want those, but we also want a nice variety and a nice selection of jobs from, you know, the warehouse up to the front office. It's a good point. I, a lot of, you got a lot of questions in there that... You know, you have to deploy different we're, strategies. We're but let me give you two quick answers. Shell buildings were a big thing in the 70s and 80s. I can take you by 30 industrial parks in this state who built a shell building, took them 20 years to fill the shell building, but the rest of the park filled up. Because it was a signal that they were ready and you could, you could be up and running. So, yeah, it took them a long time to move the shell building, but it actually attract, it acted like a magnet. Um, I'm not suggesting you go do that, but what we've been doing, and have finally gotten some interest um, from some spec industrial property developers, 
and there hadn't been a lot of spec industrial property developed across the country in the last 10 years simply because of the way financing uh, on those is done. But we've actually sent probably 20 sites to two different spec developers who got interested once they saw Lidl and Harris Teeter here. And what they do is they'll typically build a, a spec facility, and if they don't immediately spend, fill it up, they run their own third-party logistics where they, they have clientele along the East Coast, and they'll just run their logistics for them out of this facility until they find a buyer. Uh, one of the more frustrating runs, uh, and, and I'll tell you the story and then do whatever you want to do at this point, but the, the definition of what is white collar and what is the better job, I think it, it's going to be very difficult for us to get a corporate headquarters because we... When you compete with Fairfax County that has more vacant office space than Richmond has office space, that's tough to compete with. I mean, they'll just give it to you. Um, and that's hard. Uh, on your comment about lobbying in Congress, I'm not sure what address you're supposed to have to lobby Congress to be successful these days. But um, the, we lost a project because of 95. As a matter of fact, the state lost the project. Uh, two months ago, it was a high-end technically driven advanced manufacturer. Uh, we had the perfect site for them here in the county. Um, we were competing with Chesterfield. There were 120 jobs. I think, Tom, 60 to 70 of the jobs, you had to be an engineer or have a hard science degree because of the type of material they were working with. So they had to have chemistry degrees, physics degrees, mechanical engineering, material sciences. Uh, those jobs were going to pay two, two and a half times your county average. So very good jobs. Um, well, it was a Canadian firm. Uh, the president of the company wanted to be within an hour's drive of a direct flight to get to his plant. Uh, well, that immediately eliminated Richmond because they didn't have a direct flight to Montreal. Uh, so, you know, pretty good shape, right, we thought, until somebody in the boardroom raised their hand and said, I lived in Fairfax. You can't depend on that. So the company's going to Charlotte. And, you know, that was a story we shared as part of uh, the request from the chamber on advocating for the Atlantic Gateway. We had a, that was the first time we really had it documented that, and it, I mean, it was a great project, absolutely great project. Uh, so we just have to keep chipping away at it. That's all we can do. Okay. And last thing is, I did check, and it is uh, July 28th at 8. Is the EDA Thank you. Meeting. 8 a.m., right? 8 a.m., yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A quick thing, uh, believe it or not, I've got a couple calls from people uh, because of the election coming up and what Mr. Trump has threatened to do with uh, uh, tariffs and stuff like that as far as coming into the country, bringing them 35 percent, stuff like that. So I've actually had a couple people call that said they would like to move in from take the con they they have a company here but they have a company in England and stuff of that nature have you seen any response or have you seen anything in that nature as far as uh, FRA is uh, no there's actually unfortunately a counter at the moment um, and, and I'm not a good one to explain this we need to get a finance person in here but as you know there's this whole thing about tax inversion. Pfizer wanted to move everything to Ireland or something to avoid paying U.S. taxes, so the IRS came back with some ways that made it virtually impossible for Pfizer to do that. Um, but the regs they put out will now tax as equity intercompany loans. So let's say you've got the company in U the U.K., and they need to provide an operating line for their subsidiary in the U.S. Well, that's not going to be treated as debt anymore, according to this Treasury reg. It's going to be treated as equity, which only in IRS world would you treat debt as equity. But that we've, we've had conversations with a couple of organizations that represent um, international businesses that we are, are working with to try to get. Now, the National Governors Association has written about it. You know, this is... This is bipartisan objecting to what the Treasury Department's doing. They reached out to us to try to get a position from our governor, so we've been talking to the EDP and the Secretary of Commerce and Trade's office. So there's a lot of swirl in, 
out there right now in the international area. As you know, we don't really have an international marketing budget, but what we have been trying to do is reach out to the domestic offices of groups that represent industries from very specific countries. Um, and, and I think in the past, I've, you know, I've shown you a, a map of where the inquiries or what comes to our website from foreign countries once you get all the hackers and all of that out of it. It really boils down to the, the, the countries we'd probably focus on would be Germany, the UK, France, or whatever the UK becomes, um, India, and South Korea. And we've been reaching out to the domestic offices of industry groups that represent them, which is what started this whole conversation on the, uh, the tax inversion. But no, I've not gotten a thing on tariff, but <coughs> if you think we can use it, we'll try it. <laughs> so if you, you got somebody and we can help you, we'd be happy to. Okay. Any other comments? Thanks for the stopping by. Thank you. I know what it is, but I, I don't know. Are you supposed to put it in someplace? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'd like you to meet Karen Lovas. Uh, I met Karen at the Stars and Stripes, which I think was our most spectacular spectacular ever. Uh, I had a table out and a little game. I borrowed a candle chimney from my wife, bought a few jelly beans, recycled. These are recycled presentation materials from something that came to you in 2007 that I found upstairs in the office. Because every year, as I explain to people that stop by at the Stars and Stripes, every year our budget team tries to figure out how many jelly beans we're going to have to meet the county's needs for the upcoming year. And we can't go over because we can't have a deficit. We can't print money like the feds do. So it's a pretty challenging game. Here are my jelly beans. And this lovely lady came by. She was on uh, page 25 out of 49 pages. I received more than 200 guesses, got a chance to talk to a lot of citizens, a lot of visitors, and we had a great time. Karen Lovas, you guessed the number of jelly beans in that candle chimney. That is 1,623 jelly beans. Who counted? And uh, my son, who uh, and, and his college buddy were home, and they counted out the jelly beans, sealed them up in the candle chimney for me, and we put together some donated items as a gift basket, and I asked Ms. Lovas if she would come out today just so we could congratulate her on that guess and send her home with that basket, and thank you so much for playing our game. <laughs> I don't, that we, what we didn't Im, include in the basket was an honorary appointment to the Citizens Budget <laughs> Review Committee. <laughs> but but I, I, there are at least uh, uh, some board members here who might want your uh, phone, your contact information for future reference with that. Scratch that, she said. Ms. Lovis, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations. These are all Spotsylvania goods. Ooh. And thank congratulations, you. and God bless you, man. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Who eats, who eats, who eats the jelly beans? Yeah. <laughs> I knew that would be your question, Mr. Sabula. Now, with a disclaimer, I did say that... Two recent college graduates have touched each and every one of these jelly beans, and I cannot... <laughs> tell you whether or not they washed their hands before they started. So I would say you are absolutely welcome to those beans because they are not coming to my house. <laughs> and Carl, if you would, we are ready for closed session. Thank you all so much. This will be your closed meeting resolution. Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn into closed meeting for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment of assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, specifically the position of county attorney, and 
Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the businesses or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community, Specific, specifically manufacturing businesses, federal government industries, techno technology business, tourism industries, leisure businesses, hospitality businesses, retail sales business, and agricultural business. And whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn into, adjourn into closed meeting for a consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel, specifically legal advice regarding contractual claims, and whereas pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.237-11A1, 5, and 7, such discussions may occur in closed meeting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors does hereby authorize discussion of the aforestated matters. So moved. Call the question. Seven, yes. Did we? Uh... Meeting, meeting resolution. Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.23712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors hereby returns to open meeting and certifies by roll call vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion to convene into closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting. Mr. Skinner. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Mr. Trampy. Aye. Mr. Ross. Aye. Mr. Bula. Aye. Mr. Yakubowski. Aye. And chair votes aye. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, next item up is a uh, report on uh, House Bill 2, which is now called the Smart Scale Transportation Funding. Excuse me, but we did have public presentation time, but there were no no person signed up to speak. I'm sorry I ran past that, but we had no one signed up. Does anyone wish to speak who had not signed up? Seeing none, we're ready for our report. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Can I have the floor computer, please? The presentation before you this evening is to, um, for recommendation for support of what used to be called House Bill 2 is now identified and recognized as Smart Scale Project. The project selection um, have been recommended by the board, by board members, through VDOT, through staff, at, and the uh, projects that are ready to move forward. We're looking at these projects to identify the ones that are ready to move forward and that will score highly for qualifications. Um, the identified projects have been vetted through several meetings, and those include um, Transportation Committee February and April of 2016. The project identified are Harrison Road Bridge over I-95, the Harrison Road widening from the terminus of the current construction just west of Route 1 to Salem Church Road, the I-95 exit 126 ramp lane improvements, that's uh, identified as the alternative three um, for the construction with the um, exit 126 improvements. The route one lane improvements with turn lane extensions following through to South Point Parkway. That's the second portion of uh, the alternative three. So what those two together would be the continuation of a ramp exit improvement for a right turn lane, one full lane on Route 1 South all the way through South Point Parkway. And the fifth project is Courthouse Road and Smith Station Road improvements. And those will mirror the improvements that are be being done right now at uh, Smith Station Road. The smart scale projects um, will receive higher scoring when there's a clear demonstration from county commitment has been proven. The funding from Route 2 and Route 17 study and Route 1 and Route 208 corridor study is proposed to be, be moved to utilize funds 
um, for the interstate justification report for I-95 and Harrison Road. The interstate justification report, the I IJR, will be utilized um, not only to show value, but it will also demonstrate the importance for this interchange improvements on Harrison Road, and it will possibly make this score higher. The re recommendations here is for staff, along with Virginia Department of Transportation and the Transportation Committee, um, to recommend approval of the proposed five alternatives. Staff with the coordination from VDOT and the Transportation Committee recommend approval of these proposed applications. There's a resolution attached um, that's been prepared in your packet as well. And at this time, it's, it's just an um, identification that the board is support of these. This recommendation is a resolution that will be used as part of the prioritization process, and we will um, use that in the application process to make sure that it shows full county support that the board is on board with these, the proposed five projects. Okay. Any comments? Mr. Trampy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Paul, last night you answered a question from King George uh, such that with only two projects, they didn't really need to specify which was their number one priority. Um, since we have five, is that enough where we should, in our application, specify or rank them based on priority, or does that not matter? I said that the uh, smart scale process will request that the applicant rank the projects the reason why last night I said that it probably would not matter is that uh, I'll say for the last go around the state uh, kind of tried to uh, discourage too many applications because they were worried there would be a flood of them. Uh, it turned out that that was not the case, that they basically reviewed every application that came. Uh, and with regards just to the, the scoring, basically it doesn't really matter based on what the locality rank is. So if you had like 20 applications, then it might matter. But just with this number of five, they're, they're all going to probably go through and be scored. So it probably doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. Any comments? Mr. Yakubowski? Thanks. Uh, you had said back, I think it was in the April meeting, uh, that's better to have a lot of smaller projects than one great big project uh, that we put forward. Uh, is this enough? Do we have more? Because I know in the last go around, you know, we, we got them approved. So were there others that we could have put in there that could have gotten improved? So are we selling ourselves short? And where's that magic tipping point where you don't look like you're asking for too many, and but you get enough? I'll say for the last go around, uh, Spotsylvania, as well as a lot of the localities in the Pimple region probably did not have enough projects and money was left on the table for the district grant program. Uh, I'll say basically, you know, for this go around, we're, we're definitely doing better. The one comment I would have, you know, on the, the current spots of any list is there, there were a potential, a couple potential smaller projects, which probably would have scored pretty well, uh, which, you know, if, if you still have time to consider, you, you might consider also submitting. We're asking basically GWRC or FAMPO to submit. Question for you, um, IJR. So again, I think that's a, what do we need to initiate the IJR for Harrison Road? Because we'll, we want that in place, right, moving forward right. prior to the submission. Right. The uh, estimate uh, from VDOT on the cost of the IJR is in the uh, range of five hundred dollars to $600,000. I'll say that uh, having that commitment uh, could help basically with uh, getting right. improvements to Harrison Road. And then just in terms of planning down the line for the next round of smart scale, if the county wanted to go for funding for a actual interchange at that location, having the IGR completed would be required by that time period. And, and you have time to complete the IGR before the next round of smart scale. So if I, so a couple things. One, can you use cost sharing or with VDOT sharing Cur on this? Well, currently with the Route 2 and 17 and Route 1 and 208 corridor studies, um, there have been identified $200,000 in revenue share on each of those projects. So with 200000 our funds, 200 their funds, it's 400000 for each one of those projects. With the uh, estimated IJR being around 600000 mm -hmm. we currently would be able to have, we, we would have $800,000 to use for that. So we have the funds to move forward on this. And my understanding, too, because this was uh, that Federal Highways and VDOT was supportive of an interchange at Harrison Road. They yes. were support. So 
So this potentially makes a lot of sense for us to move forward on this and then compete in smart scale next round. Correct. And just for like last year's um, applications, we were advised to have one good solid application, maybe two. And um, we had two solid applications and we tried to be a little bit more aggressive and the board was more aggressive and we submitted three and, and we were lucky to get all three funded. So we could have submitted four. Uh, I'm glad and thankful that we didn't just submit one. All right, so I guess the question too that I think Mr. Yankabowski brought up as well is that are there some low hanging fruit, small dollar projects that we wanna throw out there as well or are we ready to add those to the list as well? We had three identified three identified projects: um, the the Breckenridge um, inter interchange, the Route 208, and Hudgens Road, um, and the third one was Lafayette. the Lafayette Route One, um, Lafayette Harrison Road, um, right there from Route One between Harrison Road or Harrison Road between Lafayette and Route One. So those three were identified as well, and those were brought forward. And um, this information is great to, to hear from, from Paul that those three projects could possibly be included, and we could certainly include those three projects to have eight instead of just the five, and we could certainly change that recommendation or add those to the resolution. They have been identified with RSDP and CMAC funds, but they were only um, identified as being completely funded through PE, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Do you have the capacity to submit those? I do. And that would give us the ability to apply for district funds as, as opposed to the, uh, the corridors with statewide significance, the other, the other ones with the I-95 Harrison Road. Um, so I guess the other question, IJR, is that a motion from the board what do we need to do to initiate the IJR <clears throat> the resolution in your packets identifies the the moving of these oh and two so projects. it's already in there. okay I, I've included it in the packet as well and I could certainly change that resolution to add those three other projects as well okay. mr. chair mr. Ross so is it possible I, I'm thinking first I'd like to do you have an example? I've heard, I'm, I'm concerned about the Harrison Crossing or Harrison Road interchange on I-95 with the home developments that are east of I-95. Is there a diamond, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet myself, a diamond interchange that would not affect the property rights of those that are east of I-95 to complete, a great extent? The, the complete design has certainly <clears throat> not been done yet. Sure. Um, the, the design itself I know would be, um, what was it called? A d diamond? Diamond. A diverging diamond? <clears throat> Diver di uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, but as far as the full taking, I know that when it was discussed with Virginia Department of Transportation, the minimal impacts um, to make sure that we got the most for our money is always our approach. It's staff's approach, and VDOT mirrors that and knows that we are trying to make sure that we are um, very sensitive to the existing and surrounding conditions. I believe that... Um, no matter how they did it, there was one um, full taking. I believe it would be the church. Um, but And there were some other smaller properties, <clears throat> but I, again, that nothing has been engineered. Right. Um, it's sure. just a matter of putting lines on paper, but a absolutely being as sensitive as possible. But the other question I have is uh, an interchange at Harrison would definitely help the city of Fredericksburg, too, and some of their traffic issues. Would it be possible for them to help fund the IJR with Spotsy and revenue sharing? Well, Does the IJR itself would be a county-administered project. That would be county done. Um, with speaking with Paul and Yellow and, and looking at the Harrison Road, the route of the I-95, there is a possibility that we could have GWRC or FAMPO submit one of those applications for us and, and possibly do that as a regional-type project. And that's something that we could certainly work out, and that's an approach that we certainly could take. But the IJR would not qualify as a regional for the no. I-95 interchange? Uh, not to my knowledge. The, the uh, issue with uh, smart scale is that the process does not allow a study only uh, project to be submitted. So that's the issue for why it can't be submitted for smart scale. The other issue with smart scale is basically if that were submitted, you wouldn't actually maybe have the funding to do it for a couple of years, which would delay the process of actually doing the study and then being in a position to go after more funding for an interchange project. 
Thanks. Any other comments? Mr. Chair. Mr. Spiller? Yes. Um, from what I've heard, it seems to be uh, to our advantage to add the three projects to this list. What is, if any, the downside of doing that? Getting denied. I mean, or moving it out to out years and using county funds. But we would still, the original five, if they were accepted and these were denied, or if would one of the three being added be accepted and one of our original five be denied as a result of that? Go ahead, Paul. I don't believe so. I believe the only downside is it would be a little bit more work basically for staff to create the applications. But I'll say it's very likely that they could be competing for different sources of funding. There's a state high, statewide high priority source of funding that the larger projects could go against. The three smaller projects would likely be going to the district grant. Uh, so they may not even be competing against one another. The oh, other right. issue I'll say is last go around, we, we didn't have enough regional, regional projects for district grant. And there was a lot of funding left on the table. Anything? No. no. Okay. Well, that being the case, I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm in favor of uh, uh, adding those to the project and would, uh, I, I guess a motion would be in order to do that. So moved. So we have a motion to approve the resolution and include the three additional projects. And including those three additional projects would be the turn lanes at Breckenridge, the Harrison Road improvements at Route 1 and Lafayette, and the 208 Hudgens Road. Any comments on that? 208 Hood, Hood Drive. Hood Drive. Hudgens is, I'm sorry. Hood Drive. Thank you. Mr. Yakubowski. Is, so the hood is, oh, okay. Sorry, I had my hand up. Does this, did, remember the deputy discussion? This, <laughs> Mr. Yakubowski. This, this does not include the IJR in this motion, does it? This it, is just it, the roads. Yes, it is part of one of the five. It's in the resolution, the IJR. IJR is. The IJR is okay. correct. Okay, then um, my, um, my concern about that is the is twofold. Number one, we did a... We did one of these down for exit 123 a few years ago and spent all that money and the state basically said no it's not going to happen it's too expensive so that was money that was that was spent the second one is the concern about um kingswood especially uh, being in my district and um beauclair in mr ross's district is we have talked about this before of basically doing a phase one phase two so with an IJR study, is it possible to then fund the interchange with a phase one, phase two, and just never do phase two? Because the eastern side, northern, uh, going north on 95, is the real headache. The, the uh, west side is more open and involves less taking. And so I would be opposed to it for those two reasons, simply because I would never support a um, uh, intrusion on uh, Kingswood or Beauclair uh, for an interchange like this. Um, one, one comment I'll make is just that the design of the interchange is very conceptual, basically a planning level. I'll say kind of if you've looked at just the slides in the presentation, that was just kind of uh, showing kind of what the courthouse road interchange would look like at that location. Doesn't mean that that's what the design of the interchange would be. I'm mean, going to say that it would be more expensive, but, but if you had flyover ramps, I mean, it would be possible to build an interchange off from the west side of the road. So, so, so there is the possibility. It's more expensive to do that, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. But my opposition would be that once you actually have the plan in place and you move forward with it, putting the brakes on makes it much harder. So by having the study done and saying it is going to go, um, even though it might be less intrusive on Kingswood, it still will impact those folks more than not having it. Uh, once you do the study and, and it is taken into account that it, it could work, stopping it at that point is, number one, I, I think a waste of money, and number two, it's going to be very difficult. So I'm making the statement that I can't support that, and I would actually um, wonder if Mr. Sabula wouldn't mind the IJR um, being pulled out for a separate vote, if that's at all possible. Because I do support the other projects. I just, I can't support the IJR. 
So I'm going to just fall from comment on this. So uh, the one of the questions that I have on, you know, part of the IGR is kind of the conceptual, you know, get to that point is approval and find out what the design is. Um, Correct. The diverging diamonds are probably fairly low impact as far as probably the least amount of impact for an interchange. And, you know, I agree with you. You don't want to take the homes if you don't have to. But the question is, can the design be done without a large taking? And, and that's, the, that's the part we don't know. That's and what I, we'll find out from And the I think that's why it's worth moving forward because that's a significant – you know, I always ask for the CD lanes from Route 3 to Harrison to 126 because Federal Highways and VDOT wasn't supportive of an interchange or exits onto Harrison. Now they seem to have changed their mind, and they do like the idea of uh, – and maybe it's because of these diverging diamonds. I'm not sure why they've um, changed their mind on – they like the idea of an exit at Harrison because it does – they did the – they've done the uh, the analysis, and they show considerable traffic easement on 1 and 3, so it's a – it's a big benefit to have that, and that's why I'm going to—I am supportive of at least looking at the design and determine what we do after that. So, I guess, Mr. Sabula, there's a motion on the floor. Yes, uh, and it's mine. <laughs> um, I don't have a, a problem with a separate vote, uh, as Mr. Yakubowski. Uh, so you're going to amend your motion? Yeah, I'll—I'll I'll, I'll agree to. So, the res—the motion is to, for amend the resolution for the four projects minus the IJR and include the three include additional the projects. Three. That's correct. That's correct. Five yeah. projects. It's a total of five plus the three would make it eight total projects. Well, he wants to remove the IJR. Well, the That's, IJR is not a project. It's okay, not you're a right. project. Okay. Right. right. Okay. Thank Any you. comments on that? Mr. Skinner. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Hood Drive, um, exactly. Uh, Doug, what's, what's the plan on Hood Drive from 208 down to 1, I take it, then? Is that a widening of that road to That's four correct. lanes? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Any other comments on the motion? Okay. Call the question. Seven, yes. Okay. Um, so we have the issue with the IJR. Any comments or motion? Motion to approve the funding of the IJR. Any comments? Call the question. Six yes, with Mr. Yakubowski voting no. Is that uh, everything we got? We have. Uh, Mr. In Yellow has a presentation as well. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the results of the I-95 uh, Phase One Corridor Study, which has uh, recently been completed, and talk about the uh, preferred alternative and focus more on just the Spotsylvania part of it. Can we have the floor computer, please? So the uh, objective was to uh, discover a, an improvement program to address uh, just the chronic congestion between the Garrisonville area and the Massaponics area. And uh, the study was on a, a tight time frame to be completed by this month in order to uh, help inform the, the smart scale process, which was formerly called House Bill 2. Uh, you see on this map, just in red, you see kind of the corridor study area. Uh, we focused just on that area since that had the most chronic congestion. There's a phase two study, uh, which is planned to go farther south and to look at some of the uh, still outstanding issues, such as just uh, the Route 1 Jackson Gateway interchange, as well as maybe potential new access point between Route 1 and Thornburg. Uh, in terms of just the baseline, we assumed all the committed improvements, which the major one was the southbound Rappahannock River Crossing project. Uh, in terms of just the preferred alternative, uh, I'm just going to spend a minute going through this. 
Uh, the major improvements were a extension of the express lanes from the current terminus at Garrisonville down to Route 17 to the south side of that interchange, a new direct connect ramp at Garrisonville uh, from 610 going north to help with AM uh, rush hour congestion at that location. Uh, then the northbound Rappahannock River crossing, which is widening 95 at that location from three to five lanes, uh, that included a new direct connect ramp from eastbound Route 3 to northbound 95, uh, which our modeling showed would, would work better and help alleviate congestion there and would benefit Spotsylvania. Uh, la lastly, just the biggest one in Spotsylvania was a new full interchange at uh, Harrison Road. Uh, so that Federal Highway, their policy uh, strongly favors full interchange projects. They, they don't tend to like partial interchange projects. Uh, additionally, in Spotsylvania, between uh, Route 3 and Route 1, uh, general purpose widening of 95 in the southbound direction from three to four lanes, and then in the northbound direction from Harrison to Route 3, a widening from three to four lanes. This is just another graphic which shows the improvements. Uh, the, the big ramp there you see is basically the northbound Rappahannock River crossing ramp at Route 17. I'll just briefly say that in terms of the phasing of the projects, we looked at project readiness. We also just looked at kind of targeted improvements in terms of which ones kind of gave the most benefit for the cost. In terms of just the summaries, four priority elements in the phasing. Uh, I'll say that at the time that the study began, basically the uh, projects at the top under priority element one were not committed, but, but the major one there was the southbound Rappahannock River crossing project. A uh, study strongly supported that. And then under priority element two, uh, the next highest priority was the northbound Rappahannock River crossing project. A uh, study strongly supported priority element number three was an extension of the express lanes down to the south side of Route 17 from Garrisonville. Uh, that, or I'll say most of what we include in priority element number three is now slated to be funding under the state's Atlantic Gateway program. And then priority element four, improvements between uh, Route 3 and Route 1 in Spotsylvania, the new interstate access point at Harrison Road and the general purpose lane widening to fourth lane and the southbound direction from Route 3 to Route 1 and then northbound from Harrison to Route 3. This graphic shows the um, peak traffic on a uh, weekday going southbound, and basically the, the red is just very slow traffic. Uh, at the top, basically the issue with the merge at Garrisonville, kind of the blob that's kind of more centered around the river is the constraint at the Rappahannock River Crossing Project. We feel that the projects that are recommended in this plan uh, the southbound Rappahannock River Crossing Project in conjunction with the express lane extension would largely solve this congestion issue. And then this is in the northbound direction and basically that uh, red area kind of in the south, that's a lot of the chronic congestion that uh, Spotsylvania uh, residents experience on, on weekends. Uh, we feel that that would be largely addressed by the northbound Rappahannock River Crossing Project, which is causing that bottleneck. If you look farther uh, north in uh, Stafford, th there's a little bit of red and yellow up there centered around Garrisonville. Some of the improvements uh, slated with the express lanes and the, the ramp connection in 610, which I referenced earlier, we feel would largely address that. Th this um, right here is just showing a direct connect ramp from eastbound Route 3 to uh, northbound 95. Th this is not included in the current projects for the southbound or northbound Rappahannock River crossings. Uh, VDOT has a smaller project which would create a triple left on Route 3, uh, which is shown to work out in 2025. Uh, the modeling that FAMPO did out in 2040 suggests that that would not work in 2040. So it looks to us that eventually this flyover ramp would be needed, but it's not needed yet. This slide here just shows uh, the location of Harrison Road relative to the other two interchanges. Federal Highway likes to have at least one mile of separation between 
a interchange and adjacent interchanges. Harrison Road has very good interchange spacing, so from that standpoint, Federal Highway would likely not have any concerns. This uh, just shows conceptually how the lanes for Harrison Road interchange might look. This here, this is very planning level, very conceptual. This just shows potential right-of-way impacts. This was assuming a diamond interchange similar to Courthouse. Uh, as I said earlier, the interchange would not necessarily have to be designed by this, and the IJR process could basically help flush that out and uh, perhaps reach a design which there could be consensus on. Uh, this is just a similar view kind of on the south side of the interchange. So in terms of potential phasing, uh, for just kind of moving forward, the, the first step would be beginning the interchange justification report. IGR is the acronym for that. Uh, I'll say at a minimum, that would likely take a year to execute and complete. Might be more like 15 to 18 months. So trying to begin that would be important in order to uh, bring potential interchange improvements at Harrison to a point where maybe they could advance in the next round of smart scale, which would be in two years. And then pursuing replacement and widening the Harrison Road Bridge over 95, which currently cannot accommodate a fourth lane can also not accommodate express lanes if they were ever to come farther south. Uh, three is to widen I-95 from six to eight general purpose lanes between Route 3 and the planned Harrison Road interchange area. I'll say the southbound direction would be the most important to do first based on our study results. Uh, fourth is to widen Harrison Road to accommodate future access. Uh, it'd be most important to do west of 95 first compared to the east. And then fifth is to construct uh, new interchange ramps. Uh, ramps uh, that, that are north facing are more important to do first before south facing. So we're going to continue to do outreach on the preferred alternative. We're happy to uh, provide any information or answer any questions that Spotsylvania might, may have. We have a final presentation to FAMPO scheduled for this coming Monday on July 18th. Uh, we're working on documentation of the phase one study effort. And uh, we plan a more detailed phase two study effort uh, starting this fall. We'll have that larger study area. We'll look more kind of at 95 corridors south of um, Harrison Road and, and basically Route 1. It will also be a multimodal study, which will look at uh, VRE and uh, uh, potential bus and TDM improvements in addition to highway improvements. Uh, with that, I can take any questions anyone might have. Any comments or questions? Mr. Ross? So, Paul, I appreciate everything you're doing, and, it, and there, it's kind of exciting because it does look like we're getting regional cooperation and we're all on the same sheet of music. One of my concerns is, though, and I've commuted up north for at least a decade, is the, the terrain seems to sometimes cause the traffic backups. For instance, at mile marker 148, the back gate of Quantico, there's a steep downhill followed by an uphill where the, um, the ramp is right there at the bottom of the hill. And, and for a good part, we seem like when we cross the Rappahannock, we go down a steep hill and up, no matter whether you're going north or south. And I personally think tractor-trailer traffic slows us down, and we get bottlenecks there. And we're pouring a lot of money right into that area, which is good. But it would be nice to have other bridge crossings. Uh, and I'm still a fan of a bridge crossing further west out on the Rappahannock. Uh, a while back before you were on FAMPO, this board, I think, voted 7-0 for uh, dropping down off of the Berea Parkway, and I don't know if it's still the name. It seems like we change names a lot on different things. I just recently saw, like HB, or this, the, whatever we're calling this. Uh, Smart Scale. Smart Scale now, another name change. Um, but I would still ask that, and I, I'm on FAMPO, I'll bring this up, that we still look at an alternative bridge crossing or another bridge crossing that's not all in the same point that could relieve uh, traffic off of 17 and 3 and, and 95 at the same time. For instance, something that would come down from the Bria Parkway uh, out to Orange County, Highway 20, Route 3 interchange. Uh, just as an idea to get ahead of the times That's uh, and not stay behind them. So thank you. And the uh, Phase 2 study effort for the corridor study could look at alternative bridge crossings. That's great. Okay. <coughs> and when is that being done? We're hoping to uh, start it this fall. Okay. Thanks a lot. Mr. Skinner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. On the new new lanes going up across the Rappahannock coming off 17, 
Are, is that going to impact, are they going to be able to do that without impacting the three lanes that we've got now? Do you know if that, what But that what will happen is there'll be basically a new two-lane bridge built to the outside of the existing travel lanes. Okay. Now, that being said, you need, you, know, you need to somehow, you know, get construction equipment and when I say the entire Fredericksburg region, we have a lot of kind of construction kind of slated really from the Garrisonville area down to the river in basically the next several years. It's a good issue, but they're going to be kind of made into traffic issues with that. So I, I can't say that there won't be any kind of um, construction delays to the main line as they're doing that. They may have to, for instance, just maybe take the shoulder to do something at times. Uh, I mean, I said that that's something that the state will do their best to try to manage, but I mean, that that will be an issue going forward you know, during construction for the next three or four years. So the, the plan is a separate bridge, but two lanes. Yeah, it's a separate so, bridge. Well, thank you. Right. That's That was just, you know, a lot of people asked me and I wasn't sure. So thank and, you. And the northbound, if it was funded, it would be the same thing. It would be a, a new bridge to the outside of the existing northbound travel lanes. The express lanes, if they were ever to come across the river, would be in the center. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Jankowski. Thanks. Um, thank you for the study. I still, as I've Welcome. said many times, I with with FAMPO, I'm still not convinced why we spend all of our time on I-95. It's the uh, it's the Fed's responsibility, and for the most part, no federal money to to help out with some of the issues we have. A roadblock that we're running into in in um, Massaponics with the J ramp uh, coming from the feds, and I just want to go on record as saying that the uh, amount of time that is spent trying to fix what is in unfixable, I personally think is a waste of money. There are so many other ways that we can work to connect our local roads so that our connections between uh, ourselves and King George, for example, with another bridge crossing over um, the Rappahannock to the east, taking a lot of that Dahlgren traffic that comes down through the city and on Lafayette and dispersing it out can, can work. Another bridge crossing out to the west, whether it goes as far west as Mr. Ross says or more internal, um, I think is, a, is just a better way that we need to, to focus our time. You know, we got the hot lanes, which are a billion dollars of private investment that are incredibly expensive to drive on and have not fixed the problem. We continually, you know, go through these motions of trying to fix, and, and, and it's obviously nothing, nothing against what you're trying to do, but it's just focused, I think, in the wrong area, quite honestly. I would much rather like to see once you get off the interstate, you can move around our county better. If you sit on traffic on the interstate, well, you know what? That's that's a problem that that's just out of my hands. As a local elected official, you know the interstate or the I'm sorry, the internal roads in the county are where my, my focus is going to be. Again, I thank you for all the work, but I I um, would like to see us focus more on that internal movement and not the movement from one to the other. The other reason too, quite honestly, you make it easier to get up to uh, Northern Virginia for jobs. It's going to be even more difficult to get them down here. We just had Curry Roberts who said the um, commute time has gone from about 40 minutes to an hour and 10 in about the last decade, and it's only going to get worse. And so the more money that we pour in, if we were to fix that, the jobs would never come down. So, you know, it, it's, we're disconjointed on whether we want the jobs or we want the roads fixed. And if we fix the roads, do the jobs stay up there or do they come down? And it just seems like it's an awful amount of money that we're spending to do that. But thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You know, you know the comments? <coughs> Thanks, Paul. Doug. You're welcome. Thank you. And next one, a parish is here, our uh, planning director, with a presentation on transportation. Uh, impact fees and on the noise ordinance amendments. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first item is the noise ordinance amendment. Um, sometimes uh, the county adjusts zoning ordinance and includes new zoning districts. That has happened in the past few years with the introduction of the mixed use zoning district. And then more recently, the combination of the village residential and village commercial into a single zoning district called village. Um, so there tends to be a, a snowball effect sometimes with other sections of the ordinance, and the noise ordinance is one of those. Uh, at this point in time, there's no acknowledgement of the mixed use or the village district in the noise ordinance. So what we're looking to do is clean that up. Um, so that we do have noise regulations in those zoning districts rather than the void that we currently have at this point in time. Um, it's timely to do it now before the development progresses uh, too far along in those districts. The noise ordinance itself uh, proposes to divide mixed use into its five separate sub-districts. Mixed use one, two, and three are more residential in nature. Uh, mixed use three allows some neighborhood commercial, some uh, low density office. And then mixed use four and five are much more commercial in nature. So the proposal divides mixed use one, two, and three up and, and categorizes that with residential. Mixed use four and five are categorized with commercial for the sound uh, regulations. And then the village is also categorized with the residential. Um, so this Amendment doesn't propose to change any decibel levels. It simply allocates the zoning district or the zoning sub-district in the correct category with what it's most like. Um, so with that, staff is asking that the board authorize a public hearing to consider this amendment. Oh, and I, one other item I neglected to mention. There is a um, provision in here that allows for industrial noise that is common and typical to the industry to be exempt from the noise provisions. Any questions or comments? We have a motion? All right. All right, we have a motion. Call the question. Seven yes. We have the floor computer, please. During the discussion related to the new proffer law, the board requested a presentation providing an overview of transportation impact fees. An impact fee is a method to pay for costs associated with infrastructure with, for new growth. In the state of Virginia, um, I've noted here the uh, code sections that relate to it. If you'd like to look those up, they're also included in your packet. In Virginia, it's specifically a funding source to provide growth-related transportation infrastructure. Um, that, that is it. We're, we are only enabled for transportation at this point in time. Impact fees cannot be, they can be used for capacity improvements, but not for road repair operation or maintenance. Uh, the impact fee is a one-time fee. It's assessed to all new development. Uh, so when I say all, that, in, that means any new development coming in and getting a building permits, whether it be a new Rite Aid or a new single-family home. The um, county can opt to exempt certain types of development, but the county then must pay that portion of the fee into the impact uh, fee fund. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Stafford and their approach. Um, they have actually done this. The, there are three basic requirements in the Code of Virginia that must be met in order to implement the impact fees. There needs to be an, a need or an impact. You need to prove that growth is generating the need for infrastructure. There needs to be a benefit to that new growth, um, looking at the timing of the improvements, uh, the accounting and the expenditure controls to ensure that projects are moving forward that benefit the new development um, and are being paid for with those impact fees. There's also the proportionality or the fair share of costs. The, as I mentioned, it can be used for capacity improvements, but only associated with that new growth. It cannot be used to bring a road up to standard that's currently below standard or that would be below standard because of growth that's already been approved. 
I'm just going to run through an overview of the state code requirements related to impact fees. The state code is pretty detailed on the, on the process. And the, one of the first items is to appoint an impact fee advisory committee that guides the county through the process. It, it is a five to 10 member committee. 40% uh, at least needs to be from the development building and real estate industries. The county must determine what projects, what transportation projects are going to be funded through impact fees. So we need to analyze existing road level of service and future demand from all of the approved development um, and develop a plan to fund needed infrastructure for existing and approved development. So for example, if our road that we're looking at is at a level of service C now, but the approved development that um, has either been approved through site plan or through rezoning would degrade that level of service to a D. The county is responsible for paying the, the difference to bring it back up to a C before any impact fees could be applied to that. We also would need to determine uh, future growth projections. The state code talks about um, looking at build out or 20 years, whichever is first. So for Spotsylvania County, that, that would be 20 years. Uh, and determining the road improvements needed to that, due to that growth. In Stafford County, they went through the analysis and they determined uh, their road improvements that would be needed due to growth. And about 50% of the cost of those road improvements would be attributable to the new growth that comes along that could have impact fees uh, applied to it. The county would adopt a road improvement program, and that's an amendment to the comprehensive plan incorporated in the capital improvements plan and the VDOT secondary six-year plan. Uh, so that road improvement plan is the roads that are proposed to be improved through this program. The county could determine service areas, in other words, have smaller um, areas than countywide that uh, an impact fee would be applied to. Um, as I'm gonna mention later, Stafford County implemented impact fees and they had a couple of different service areas. They were smaller. Um, they have since converted to a countywide impact fee and that's one of their recommendations to us is to go with a countywide impact fee and a countywide road improvement program. There would be an ordinance adopted that would establish those fees and that would actually have the exact list of what the fee is um, for each type of building. Um, whether it be a single family detached unit and that would be a per unit fee or it might be um, for a convenience store it would be a per square foot fee. Um, and when you develop that list, you're, you're typically using the ITE categories for the different types of businesses. So, so you're gonna have your general office, you're, you're gonna have a medical office, you're gonna have convenience store with gas station without gas. So, so it, it, it gets to be pretty detailed, but um, you do the analysis based on the impacts um, and then use those, this thing keeps forwarding on me, um, and, then, and then use those fees within your ordinance and, and then those are the fees that are calculated at site plan or plat and they are collected at building permit. Uh, in terms of implementation, the state code does require credits for offsite improvements that add capacity or for cash proffers. So if the impact fees were implemented and then a project came forward uh, to the development stage that did offer a cash proffer or an in-kind proffer for transportation improvements that were off-site that benefited the larger network and not just their project, uh, there would be a credit applied for that. Um, so obviously in the case, case of cash proffers, that would be a very easy calculation of what cash proffer um, they have and does it completely offset the impact fee and if so, then they just pay that cash proffer. The code requires that there be refunds for projects that are not completed within 15 years or if estimated costs exceed actual by 15%. Uh, so as you can see, there's a bit of work here to track and implement a program such as this. Um, so the county would need to be sure to have uh, 
the staffing and perhaps the software. Uh, there is a review required every two years and then update if necessary. Stafford County is the only county in my survey that I could find that has implemented uh, impact fees. And they recommend that we hire a consultant to ensure the defensibility of the final output. Um, and also just the entire process of, of, of pulling together and figuring out what your roads are going to be, what portion of the need is attributed to the new growth, and then what the costs are. It, it's, it's a very uh, detailed and cumbersome process. Um, just be aware that funds cannot be used to fis fix existing issues. Um, they recommended to establish a very clear fee implementation date and make sure it is widely advertised. Um, and again, they experienced both the um, service district that is not countywide, the multiple service district approach, and then also the countywide service area. And they do recommend the countywide service area. I believe originally the way that the state code was set up, you could not do a countywide um, service area, but then it, it changed, um, so they were able to implement that. Uh, no new development is exempt, but the county can subsidize the development. And what Stafford does is they cover the contributions associated with non-residential development. They cover those at 100%. And then, and as well as family division development. And then they also subsidize a portion of the residential development. Um, they have a cap on residential at $2,999 as the impact fee. Um, when they went through the process, the actual fee would have been $5,400 for a single family detached home. Uh, so the county is contributing the $2,401 while the uh, developer or the property owner is contributing the $2,999 at their building permit. Um, the Chesterfield is another locality that, that uh, studied impact fees. I believe Prince William did, Spotsylvania County did, um, but none of these counties decided to move forward with implementing them. Uh, I would note that I looked up the study. We had Tischler Bice assisting us, and uh, that uh, contract was $135,000. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Trampy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is the need that is assessed for each individual project or for each individual application, uh, for example, if it's in Lees Hill, the transportation might cost more than if it's in... Uh, if it's down by Lake Anna? Yes, the, if, if you go with a county-wide service area, then it's a flat fee everywhere. Uh, when we studied this several years ago, um, I want to say it was in 2006, um, we, were, we had an approach that had two service areas that covered the entire county. And one was more uh, on the eastern side of the county with the, the higher growth, and then one was the rural areas. And the road list really dictates what your fee is going to be. There, there were more expensive and more projects in the urbanized area of the county, and therefore a higher fee, whereas in the rural area of the county, there were fewer projects and at a lower cost, so the fee there uh, would have been significantly lower for any development that occurred there. And um, for the, the credit for proffers, if, say, there's uh, something built which had been approved uh, back when we had proffer guidelines, it would only be the transportation proffers which would be offset. Is that? that that's correct. It's a specifically transportation proffer or a transportation improvement offsite that benefits the network. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Mr. Spiller? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that I understand this totally. Um, if we have fees, uh, if we have a, a countywide impact fee, 
then for a house anywhere in a county, let's say it's going to be $3,000, okay? Um, and we're going to collect that fee whenever the site plan or the plat is uh, submitted. We're going to calculate it at that time and then collect it at the building permit. Okay, so so if it's countywide, we have a fixed fee, so we don't have to calculate it. Uh, it's per house. Yes, for the the residential, it's more straightforward than uh, for the non-residential. It'd be a square foot fee, and then you just have to do the calculation based on okay. the, the category okay. of commercial it is. Yeah, I, uh, my my concern was that uh, somebody's going to come in and. Uh, uh, with a site plan and and get surprised with this whatever the fee is but if it's already a fixed fee then they're going to know that up front yeah and I think that's why Stafford emphasized establishing a clear date that's far enough into the future that you can advertise it get the word out and that people that are in the process of, of uh, drawing up plans and developing plans that that they can take that into account in their uh, financial pro forma okay, thank you Mr. Skinner. Um, so, look, you, we've just talked about commercial being by square foot. Are we also talking about one fixed fee, whether it's a attached, detached, or are there going to be separate fees for individual units? Um, I believe that it's, I can look really quick at what ours was when we ran through this before. We had it divided out by single family detached and then a separate category was multifamily and other residential so we had basically two categories of residential you were either a single family detached or you were some other type of residential with different fees then yes with two separate fees um, and so uh, if it was an apartment or a townhouse it would qualify under that multifamily and other residential okay uh, and the uh, the last thing was the if if no construction is done by 15 years, then the funds are refunded to the developer or who's ever put those funds Who paid in there. Them, yes. Where does that money go to, and how do we control that money? Because I have the, I've still yet to see proffers that are put aside and where they go to and stuff of this nature. So how do we do that? Yeah, it would be required to have a separate dedicated account for transportation impact impact fees. So there there would be that new budget line item for transportation impact fees where, where all of the funds collected would need to go. And if the county were to take an approach where there were two service areas or we just set up three service areas, there would need to be three separate accounts. If it was one countywide uh, service area with one set of fees, it would be one and we collect them, you Budget. said, at the permitting? Yes. When you when you give them the permit to do that? Okay, so my question is, if, when you say that, a pro, let's just take a 2,000 home development. Okay, so you got there and you got, does he do it by, when you say permitting, does it permit the entire 2,000 homes? Mm -hmm. Or, because my, my question is, he builds half of them, 1,000, doesn't build the other 1,000. Right. So he gets the 50% mm -hmm. back of what he paid at the permitting? Well, what typically happens is we'll get a site plan in, say it's for, for 25 homes, a okay. section of 25 homes, and we'll have that site plan. So at that point in time, they would know exactly what their fee would be per home. Right. And then as each individual building permit came in, the fee would be paid then. So <laughs> one house, one fee. So where would there be any money to refund? It would be if the county did not move forward with the transportation projects that are on the list. Okay, gotcha. If the money's not expended, creating that benefit to the people that paid the fee is when it eventually would need to be refunded. We have a similar um, requirement related to proffers. <coughs> and in that case, if the money isn't spent, it ends up going to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Benton. All right, so I can wrap my hands head around it. Um, now, let's say just I want to cut out three acres on my farm and give to my son, and he wants to build a house. So 
So there's going to be impact fee for him to pay? or that, miss a, or That's her. correct. Uh, unless you, the county did something like Stafford did, they specifically exempted family division lots, the houses that are built on those family divisions. And one of the concerns I do have, you know, Livingston, <laughs> we are a very rural district, and I already have complaints about, you know, we don't, our roads is basically uh, some pavement some t- in some places anywhere and then ditch. We don't have the, the nicer roads. We don't, don't have the, we're not having to spend that kind of money yet out in Livingston. So, and we're not really using these roads down here as much as maybe some. And my concern would be for my neighbors up in Livingston, we're, we're basically paying for the again, the more urban areas to develop their roads and to benefit. Whereas us out there, it's hard for us to even get a a ditch cleared so water will not run across the roads. Mm -hmm. That'd be one of my concerns. Um, I guess that's it. And the state code, while it does have (laughs) a structure to the process and many requirements within it, the county does have a lot of latitude in determining what area of the county, the service area would be. You know, it doesn't have to be countywide. It doesn't have to. Co- we don't have to have multiple that cover the entire county. There could be a service area that just covers the primary development area, um, and then the county also has a lot of latitude in deciding which road projects to include on that list. So, the bigger the list, the higher the fee. The smaller the list, the lower the fee. Okay. And has has Stafford actually? They've implemented this already, or are they in the process of... No, they, they did in 2014, so they've got a couple of years now of collecting the fees. How, how, do they give any feedback on how it's working, or um, how, like, in their rural areas, what's left? Uh, not specifically, no. They, they've just been collecting the fee, and what they're doing is, um, like I mentioned earlier, they have figured that 50%, their, their um, cost that can be attributed to that new growth... <coughs> is uh, 50%, so they are uh, using revenue sh- funds. They're putting the, the impact fee funds towards revenue sharing, um, and they can put uh, half re- towards revenue sharing, and then the county needs to um, make up the difference for the other half because only half can come from impact fees because only half of the need is created by the new growth. Okay. I just, I'm just very concerned about, especially out in our area, being responsible for a bunch of roads and the impacts in this end when we we just don't use it that much i don't i don't think and you know like i I've, you know fee, we've got enough fees i think already like I say I, I discussed with you at one point a gentleman on courthouse road he's mm-hmm. trying to buy not even well maybe an eighth of an acre he's just trying to increase his some boundary right next to his driveway, about 12 foot by 360 foot long. And, you know, six th- it comes out to somewhere around $6,000 that he's going to have to pay in fees to just get a little extra buffer on his property. And it's just I, just a comment. Mr. Sabula. Yeah, Tim, just a quick one. Uh, we talked about this uh, after 15 years, this fee. Uh, is refunded, is that with interest, or is, are there interest charges? Uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Where are we going to be? Where are we going to be with this? Well, if the county moves forward uh, with the road projects implementing the plan, then there's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know the answer to the, the interest question. Okay. I, I would okay. need to research that. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Yankamowski. So Stafford did it back in 2014. Do you know how much they've collected? I don't know that. I can look into that. And okay, because it seems like if you're, gonna, if you're going to have an impact fee and then you subsidize um, most of it, I don't know, it seems like more of a headache than, than anything else. So then you don't know what improvements have been done up in Stafford. I believe, as I understand it, they've just been putting funds towards their revenue sharing. Oh, okay. You know, to, to progress through and fully fund a project. So okay. as you know, with revenue sharing, sometimes it, it, it's quite a ways out into the future. So as I understand it, no projects have been completed with it. It's only been two years, but they have been putting using the money to um, contribute towards their revenue share. 
And they did roll out the impact fees, if I'm correct, um, in zones last time. And that was a headache beyond belief. Um, up on 17, mm -hmm. I think, was, was one of them. Yes. And I think it was because of where the line was, then the person on the other side of the line right. didn't have to pay anything. So. And, and what they found was that uh, because they had two small impact fee areas, businesses would look at the impact fee area, and then they'd look outside it and say, well, I'm going to locate outside of it. Right. So they just weren't seeing the growth inside the area that would then benefit the transportation network. Well, and, and that's a sort of a subset of if you are then an impact fee county, you know, a business would then look at another county because it's just an added fee on top uh, of what you're doing already. So that is another consideration, yes. But thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. That brings Thanks. us down to informational matters. Wanda, could you pull up while you're there? Candlelight the vigil? Pardon? Yes, the candlelight okay. vigil just, slide. Okay. Uh, floor computer, please. Yeah, I just uh, had one item I wanted to make everyone aware that uh, Sheriff Harris has put out this invitation uh, Wednesday, tomorrow night, the 13th of July, 730 at the Public Safety Building over here on Dean Ridings Lane. Um, only regional law enforcement and the faith-based community leaders are coming together for a prayer vigil um, for our community. This is in the wake of the Dallas shootings and other uh, issues of uh, strife and violence across the country. Um, and it, it is truly is a regional um, coming together of law enforcement and local officials and would encourage uh, everyone to come out for this event. All good? That's all I have. Okay. Uh, Mr. Skinner, you any board reports? I do, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Sabula for uh, gathering the uh, high-speed rail uh, over there at the Christian School. It was a great job. Thank you for doing that. I think we, you had a, a fantastic turnout there. I think what it showed is that there's so much information out there that people don't completely understand what was going on. And I'm not sure after last night they fully do anyway. But I think it was an attempt by the uh, Department of uh, Rail and Public Transportation to let them know what, what's really been going on for the last two years. I mean, the study hasn't just started up, but it's now getting down to the point where draft proposals and stuff of that nature. But what I, I really wanted to do right now is just let people know that, that there were a lot of concerns out there by these new alternatives, and the alternatives for the high-speed rail was not actually for the high-speed rate, the high-speed rail train itself, rather than the freight trains that are probably um, consuming some of the rail and uh, slowing down really what Amtrak is having a problem with. Amtrak is not being able to fully, fully uh, uh, carry a line uh, to their capacity, what they would like to do. So um, what we found out was that there are some alternatives there, and most of them were going through people's properties. And I think that was the biggest concern is the taking of personal property there. Uh, I will tell you that we spent uh, extra time after the meeting was over with some of the people there. Uh, there is a potential alternative that actually is using current rail system that we got going through the county right now. And that's where we started to look at the potential of, of doing that without hurting anybody's property. So the engineer that I spoke to said no, they had not looked at that and because there was a problem with a southbound freight train who needed to turn around and go back north have in the Fredericksburg region. And we showed them where they could do that, and so they're going to potentially look at that. But I, I think one of the things we really want to know is why, why their solution was the further south and the most expensive one that you could put up, because rail is very expensive, as we know, to put the third rail in that, that uh, VRE did here at the new Spotsylvania station. So um, uh, we will be, I know that Mr. Sabula was uh, very on top of it. Uh, I'm going to be definitely talking to him more and more. We've been involved with it the last two years. Um, and again, this 
I, I think the public comment is very, very important, especially when it goes to the Federal Railroad Authority, the FRA. So don't hesitate to, as they gave out the, the um, website, to put your comments in there. It's, it's very important because these comments will be collected. And I know Mr. Benton was there last night, too, to, to look at it. So he, he, he understands a little bit more that's what's going on, too. Um, but uh, again, thanks, Greg. I think this was a great thing for you to do. And I think hopefully uh, people will understand. And, and I know I personally will keep on top of this. There's many a people in my district, too. Um, they wanted to run the track right through Belvedere Farm. And that's been associated here many, many years, and we just can't let that type of things happen. So we'll be on top of it and keep talking to them. So, and um, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I had. Mr. Benton? I got two things. Uh, one is um, I was going to ask the board if they would mind me serving on the social services. I did not get this on the agenda, um, and it's my fault. The lady that represents my district uh, called me several weeks ago and let me know, and I just failed to act on it, be quite honest. Is that a uh, chairman appointed position, or is that a... It's a social services commission. No, that, but it's for your district. Right. right. I'd, I'd, I'd like to sit on it, if I may. If I, don't know, I, I don't know if I should make a motion or... Sure. I'd make a motion that the board allow me to uh, sit on that commission. Okay. Any objection? Call the question. <laughs> Seven yes. Thank you. And lastly, I just want to announce I, I am having a uh, town hall joint town hall meeting with the uh, with school board member Kirk Twig. On uh, Tuesday, July 19th at 6.30 p.m. at the Todd's Tavern Community Center. This will be my second one, and I'm just hoping to have good attendance and good uh, communications. Okay. Mr. Trampy? No report. Mr. Ross? I just have one thing, Ed. It's the uh, drainage down on Waverly Drive. I know you've been working on it, but I've gotten a lot of more calls with the rain. I know Sean Nelson's worked on it a little bit. Um, Doug Craig is uh, leading the charge down there from the Homeowners Association. So if you could look into that, and we've, we've driven over there before, and if I could get an update on what the status is, what the county is going to do or, or not do. Thank you. Mr. Sabula. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, uh, thank you, Gary, for uh, uh, the kudos on the uh, meeting. Kind of stole some of my report here, but that's all right. Um, uh, that was a very successful meeting last evening. Uh, there were between 250 and 300 uh, people showed up. Uh, they were from a, um, a tri-county jurisdiction. They weren't all from Spotsylvania. Uh, did have representative uh, from uh, Stafford County there. Uh, and uh, there were the people asked the questions. They didn't necessarily get get answers to those questions other than we're, we're studying this and we'll get back to you. But uh, the people do need to submit their additional comments on their, uh, on their website. Um, on uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, public safety meeting, uh, I have an agenda item there that uh, I'll be bringing up concerning water safety on uh, Lake Anna, and uh, if anybody wishes to show up uh, at the public safety meeting uh, tomorrow, two o'clock at the public safety building. Um, I'm pleased again to uh, report uh, Route 1 is complete. Traffic is moving through there. Uh, people will like what's happened, uh, but in that regard, letters just went out last week to um, uh, property owners on uh, the Mud Tavern Road uh, that they are considering uh, the widening uh, to four lanes of Mud Tavern Road. So uh, uh, studies are now beginning uh, in that area. Uh, and uh, lastly, mowing and uh, road repairs uh, have been underway all month in uh, Berkeley District, and I'm pleased to say that most of the roads have been uh, mowed. 
and uh, uh, temporary repairs have been made to a, to a lot of the roads, uh, pending final pavement. Uh, thank you. Mr. Yankabowski. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to thank everybody who came out for the Independence Day celebration. I think we had not only exceptional weather, it was a great time. Um, one of the things uh, we spoke about the EDT uh, committee, and we've talked about it for a couple of years, but one of the things that I think that we should add is a parade. And uh, not only celebrate our nation's birthday, and we'll have a little fun at the same time, too. Uh, also want to thank uh, the volunteers who came out to man the Sister City booth, uh, Eric and Brenda Martin, uh, Sherry Bowden, and Brian Moody, and myself. Uh, we took shifts in doing that and met a lot of uh, uh, residents who were interested in what we're doing and uh, really trying to get that moving along. Um, and also thank you to uh, Debbie Ayler for all of her help in getting that set up and, and the tent and everything else that she was able to, to furnish us with. Thank you. And Chair has no comment. Any other business? We have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Call the question. <laughs>